two of the nation's most influential conservatives and congenial gentlemen recently got into a scrap. One published an essay announcing that he had decided to become a national conservative. The other wrote a letter to the editor questioning his friend's judgment and explaining that he intended to remain a conservative without national or any other adjective, just a plain conservative. Today, they're here to duke it out. Christopher DeMuth and Matt Continenti on Uncommon Knowledge Now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. We are filming today at the offices of the American Enterprise Institute in Washington. Now a fellow at the Hudson Institute, Christopher DeMuth is a graduate of Harvard University and the University of Chicago Law School. He served in the administrations of Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan, and from 1986 to 2008, Mr. DeMuth served as president of the American Enterprise Institute. He is widely regarded, and I so regard him, as one of the most influential conservatives of the last five decades. Now a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, Matthew Continenti, is a graduate of Columbia University. He served on the staff of the Weekly Standard, founded and edited the Washington Free Beacon, and now serves as a contributor to National Review. Mr. Continenti is the author of several books, the most recent published this very spring, The Right, The Hundred Year War for American Conservatism. Matt is widely regarded, and I so regard him, as one of the most influential conservatives of the last decade and a half. Chris, Matt, welcome. All right, here's the dispute. Let's set it up. Two quotations. Christopher DeMuth in the Wall Street Journal late last year in an article headlined, Why America Needs, Needs National Conservatism. Quote, NATCONs, that is national conservatives, NATCONs are conservatives who have been mugged by reality. We have come away with a sense of how to recover from the horrors taking America down." Close quote. Matthew Continenti in a letter to the editor just a couple of days later. Christopher DeMuth's Why America Needs National Conservatism was so fascinating, I read it twice. And the second time I conducted an experiment. I removed the adjective national wherever it modified conservatism and found that it didn't make much difference to his case. I'll take my conservatism without modification. All right, let's begin with some definitions here. Christopher DeMuth, the most urbane and sophisticated man any of us have met. What is this raw, crude thing, national conservatism? Uh, without acknowledging that it is raw and crude, uh, but agreeing that it is young and feisty and finding its way, uh, it is a new species of conservatism that is attempting to refresh, rekindle uh, the various conservatisms uh, that were influential in the past, in the last uh, half of the 20th century. Uh, traditional social conservatism, libertarianism, neoconservativism in two uh, subsequent uh, formulations, uh, to try to bring, as we regard it, conservatism up to date to a dramatically new set of challenges and problems uh, that we face in the, uh, in the 2020s. Um, some, if I can go on, of course. Uh, some, some, of the, some of the new developments, I would say, are strictly uh, demographic, technological, things like things such as uh, social media uh, that, uh, that did not exist back in those days that have transformed our politics. Uh, but many of them are political and ideological. Uh, in particular, the, um, the emergence of what is often called wokeism, which is a kind of a class-based uh, Marxist form of, uh, of uh, left-wing uh, thinking uh, that has uh, become increasingly influential 
Uh, it is now uh, an important part of the Democratic Party, both nationally and in states and cities around the country. Uh, and that has infused corporations, major sports leagues, uh, entertainment, uh, the media, uh, to a degree that was mildly anticipated 50 years ago, but has gone beyond what anybody could have imagined. Um, national conservatives believe that, that the conservatism's the different species uh, documented in uh, Matt's book, um, uh, had become in, say, after 2008, uh, too uh, formulaic and complacent and Washington-centric and had not noticed important things that were happening out in the hinterlands, uh, I had not noticed uh, the uh, increasing self-confidence and authoritarian tendencies in the media and corporate elites. Um, we were, were unhappy. Looking back, we're unhappy that conservatives in Washington kept saying, we're for limited government. But the government was becoming more and more unlimited with every passing year, often uh, with the acquiescence of conservatives who are actually in power. Mm -hmm. um, we talked on about the importance of free trade. And of course, we will retrain all the people that are hurt by free trade. But nobody was doing any retraining of the people that were hurt by uh, free trade. And as many corporations became global, that is, markets became larger than nations, uh, the nation was, uh, was national prerogatives were shriveling and foreign adversaries were using trade deliberately uh, to our uh, disadvantage. Um, I won't go on, but borders were being opened. Uh, the world was changing and just saying, um, I I'm for a balanced budget amendment as the debt goes up trillions of dollars year after year after year. A bunch of us thought, Let's not just keep repeating uh, some of these uh, mantras uh, that we got really good at uh, in the uh, 2000s. Uh, we, need to, we, need to, we need to think back to first principles underlying our uh, conservatism uh, and uh, come up with solutions uh, that are different than those that were called for in the past uh, because, uh, because the times and the challenges have changed. So, Matthew, Chris and his fellow national conservatives wish to write the next chapter in the book that you just completed, In the Right. And that chapter is entitled, Wake Up, Rethink, Fight Back. Well, well fine with you? I'm there's a lot of rethinking that's part of the history of uh, American conservatism over the last hundred years. Um, from the first waves of the neoconservatives that Chris mentioned um, to um, the compassionate conservatism we associate with George W. Bush uh, to the reform conservatism that was associated with um, the American Enterprise Institute, among other places, um, beginning in the second half of the Bush era. I see national conservatism as... Um, kind of the latest uh, attempt to um, reformulate conservatism for a new era. What I'm struck by is um, the uh, departures in some ways from um, the post-war conservative movement um, of the last 65 years. And in particular, it's on this question of limited government. Um, the, uh, the national conservatives, it seems to me, are much more open toward using the power of the state, uh, in particular, to um, subvert these cultural institutions uh, which have been taken over by this woke left. And um, so this is making uh, many people uh, on the right uncomfortable um, because it's, uh, it's a new position for conservatives to be in, to advocate the use of government power, um, not simply for you know, fiscal policy or uh, social policy, but in fact, to, um, uh, to, to take on 
these cultural institutions. Well, I will say one thing just to kind of preface this discussion. I think it's important, and I try to do this in the book, Peter, to distinguish between the Republican Party, the conservative movement, and the conservative intellectual movement. In fact, all three are slightly different. And I totally agree with the idea that the Republican Party had become quite complacent um, beginning in the first decade of the 21st century uh, and was relying on kind of old dogma and uh, repeating mantras. At the same time, though, I do think, uh, and, and Chris <laughs> supervised a lot of it, there was a continuous th attempt, I think, in many quarters in the, among the intellectuals uh, to come up with policies that would address these new concerns. Uh, the problem was that there was no longer a connection uh, between the policies being formulated in the Beltway and the, the larger conservative right. grassroots right. movement in the country. So can I, that's a current moment. Let's step back a decade or two or possibly three to what went wrong. We have, you're a touch young, but Brother DeMuth and I both remember the Reagan years, the 1980s, and those things seem to be working pretty well in those years. Matt writes in his new book, The Right, opposition to the Soviet Union and to the spread of communism unified conservatives. Chris spoke a moment about, ago about social conservatives, economic conservatives, internationals, all that, all that defense conservatives. William F. Buckley Jr. Refer, referred to anti-communism as the harnessing bias of the movement. By the end of 1991, the Soviet Union was gone. The right never settled on a strategy for the post Cold War world. That's what went wrong. The Soviet Union went defunct. Explain that. Well, it, I mean, it was a critical moment in the history of humanity. It was a huge um, turning point. Um, and um, it left many things unsettled. I mean, think about it. And a victory pretty particularly for American conservatism. Which had always identified itself as an anti-communist force. And from the very beginning, American conservatives distinguishing themselves from liberal anti-communists by being for rollback instead of containment, right? And that, that's summed up in Ronald Reagan's strategy for the Cold War. He told Richard Allen, right? My strategy is we win, they lose, and we won. The question then is, what comes next? And there was a series of attempts to um, recoalesce the right around new challengers, um, uh, some internal, others external. In the 1992 convention, we have Patrick Buchanan talking about the culture war, right? Maybe that would be how we're going to um, conceive of ourselves on the right. Um, after 9-11, um, Islamic terrorism. I think many people on the right felt that would be the unifying um, concern. Now we hear a lot of people discussing the People's Republic of China, the Chinese Communist Party, as the new kind of external threat that could get all of these various groups together on the right. I don't think any quite matches the Soviet threat, um, the, um, the, the way in which uh, communism um, triggered conservatives for its atheism, for its central economic planning and bureaucratic control, and then of course just for the tremendous um, threat it posed to democratic societies around the world. And you, it, Chris, what, and you don't think, I mean, the argument would be, fellas, okay, this is all lovely little intramural argument among the 200 of us who are, well, you're conservative intellectuals, I'm a would-be conservative intellectual, but this, it's all intramural. China's coming, we're all going to have a great big bad enemy and a half century long fight against, a, the conservatism will be revived by the reemergence of a truly vicious mortal enemy. So relax. Um, and Matt says, nah, I'm, not, I'm not so sure. It's a new enemy, but America is uh, a new and different place than it was. Uh, and it was not, I, I, I agree that the, the threat of Soviet communism was critical uh, to the cohesion of the uh, uh, conservative movement, but I, I, that wasn't all. There was a lot more going on. Uh, William Buckley um, sat at the knees of Albert J. Nock, the original libertarian, uh, as a boy, but he came to national prominence with 
God and Man at Yale. That was not a libertarian manifesto. Social conservatism and the idea of individual and group <coughs> freedom <coughs> were part of conservatism uh, from the beginning. Uh, in, in my view, what has changed most of all uh, is not that the old Soviet Union has been replaced by a sort of a, a, a Russian dictatorship with a lot of the old trappings of the Soviet Union uh, and by a racialist, aggressive, ideological uh, communism in, in China, uh, but that, that the world has changed. Markets are global, and the sense of patriotism in America has become radically attenuated. Uh, we have many businesses that do business in China that are much more attentive to the Chinese than to Americans, that work with the Chinese defense establishment, but wouldn't think of working with the American defense establishment, which is merely going to be a, a required to come to the aid of their headquarters if we're attacked. But they'll, they'll work with the enemies and not with us. Um, that, that's, a, that's a different kind of a world. It calls for a different kind of uh, response. Uh, will we mobilize a response? You can see straws in the wind. Uh, I think many of us were delighted when uh, Top Gun Maverick came out last week, and it turned out that Maverick's fighter jacket had had the flags of Taiwan and Japan restored to the back. They'd taken them out in the trailers uh, to try to uh, appease uh, the, uh, the Chinese communists. Uh, so, so things could be changing. I'm not optimistic. I, I, I believe that the, um, that the ideology that the nation does not matter, that there are these high ideals uh, that we graduates of Yale and Harvard who are actually citizens of the planet uh, 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 are attached to. Uh, I, I think that that is a, a very, very uh, deep problem. Um, and uh, I, I don't think that we're just going to be able to rally around the flag because the flag isn't there the way it used to be. All right. We talk, I still want to stay for a moment or two in these recent few decades. Cold War ends. Iraq, Afghanistan do not go well. 20-year right. engagement in Afghanistan, untold billions, trillions of dollars spent for what? Iraq is not, you could argue that it's of some use and that there's a somewhat democratic government. Nevertheless, the cost to us of the Iraq adventure was enormous. Okay. The left in this country, this is the point you've made, the left in this country deserves a moment of mention here. Let me quote the journalist Kevin Drum writing last year, and he, this is a blog post he put up summarizing an enormous amount of polling data. And here's what Drum writes. Drum is not a man of the right, by the way, as you well know. The obvious conclusion is that over the past two decades, Democrats have moved left far more than Republicans have moved right. I've made this point many times before, and I want to make it again more loudly. It is not conservatives who have turned American politics into a culture war battle. It is liberals. And this shouldn't come as a surprise. Progressives have been bragging publicly about pushing the Democratic Party leftward since at least 2004. And they have succeeded. Close quote. So when you have conservatives on the defensive... Chris said, talking about balanced budget amendments, when that has become clearly just irrelevant, just being ignored, you have the courts being used over and over and over again to enact the social agenda of the left. Most recently, when a Justice Kennedy, a, a, a nominated by a Republican, somehow discovers a right to gay marriage in the Constitution. Gay marriage is a separate, but it's in the Constitution. So that is something that the le that we do, we do need a new conservatism because the left has moved so far to the left and conservatism is still swatting away the flies and dro and dozing well i think it um if you'd agree with that characterization roughly um i emphatically agree that the big change in american politics is not that we've somehow become 
polarized across the board. I think that the our major liberal party has moved sharply to the left, and the the conservative party, certainly under Donald Trump, adopted some or th- some policies that were very different from what conservatives would have supported in the past. Although it was mostly mainstream, you know, tax reduction, right, deregulation, right. conservative justices to the Supreme Court. Um, and I, I think in national conservatism, we're trying to formulate some more aggressive policies. Uh, but I want to point out that <clears throat> the wokeness phenomenon has offended many people who are not national conservatives, conservatives are not conservatives of any stripe, um, uh, some good old-fashioned liberals, many just suburban people who aren't politic, particularly political, are horrified at what the Democrats are doing to uh, uh, the protection of public safety in the cities, uh, to the education of uh, school children, um, uh, to the conduct of, uh, of uh, national sports leagues. Uh, so, so, there's, so it's not just conservatism that is reacting. I would say that national conservatism's response uh, embraces and wants to work with all of these people, including people who are um, uh, old-fashioned classical liberals. But we've got we've got an agenda that is distinctive uh, so of our own. In most of this book, the right, the hundred-year war for the right. In most of this book, for the right, the right is up against, of course, the Soviet Union abroad no longer exists. A Democratic Party, which is still fundamentally the party of Franklin Roosevelt, and in the last couple of decades is the party of John Kennedy. So you've got a kind of patriotic, pragmatic expansion of the state to the extent of social security, civil rights, then the great society, and then along comes in in, in your it's just almost in your final chapter, you get this new phenomenon on the left to which conservatism should respond, how? Well, I think at first it's a generational phenomenon. I think the radicalism we see on the left appeared in the 1930s, it appeared in the 1960s. It appeared briefly in the early 1990s and late 1980s over the spats over the Western canon at Stanford University, for example. Hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ is right. about to go. Um, and so it seems to be, to be anyway, to be about a 30 year um, recurring phenomenon. So it's not as though conservatives have never dealt with the radical left before. A couple changes. The first is, it, it hasn't been the party of JFK for some time, Peter. LBJ. Um, but, or yeah, LBJ. All right. uh, 1972, of course, George McGovern, the senator from South Dakota, becomes the Democratic nominee. The McGovernites slowly take over the party. Now, that's a decades-long process, uh, really meaning uh, involving the ending of the Southern Democratic Party. Um, but uh, you had the left, the anti-war left, the culturally progressive left, um, in a kind of a catbird seat in the Democratic Party for some time. The other thing that happened, I think, is Barack Obama. Barack Obama um, saw it uh, as his self-assigned mission to uh, change America, to uh, set America, as he put it, on a new foundation, to um, take us down a few notches on the world stage. You know, we weren't number one. Uh, time that we had to learn to um, play uh, as, uh, you know, as just one of a crowd. Um, and this had uh, the effect of moving the Democratic Party to the left, uh, but also making the right very concerned about the direction of this country and the perpetuation of its traditions. Uh, then uh, one other thing happened I should mention too. The phenomenon that we're currently experiencing as, as wokeism isn't to some degree a response to President Trump. While these, these, these radical tendencies have always been there on the progressive left, mm-hmm. I do think Trump's presidency amplified and accelerated them um, to the point that we now have to consider taking the type of measures that national conservatives are thinking of in order to somehow uh, reestablish a fair playing field uh, in the culture. So it's a dynamic process, but I guess what, what my, my fundamental point no, would be no, is that no. we've, we've seen these these fights before, and the right has often won in many cases. No Barack Obama, no AOC. No Barack Obama, no Donald Trump, no AOC. That's, that That's is the, the, the trend. All right, all right. Listen, so 
again, let me let me ask a large question about conservatism itself. Two quotations. Notre Dame political scientist Patrick Deneen. Liberalism has failed, and he's speaking here of classical liberalism, the kind of liberalism that we would associate with the Declaration and the Constitution. Liberalism has failed, not because it fell short, but because it was true to itself. It has failed because it has succeeded. The founders failed to foresee that their atomistic philosophy would act as a solvent on our civic institutions. Too much emphasis on the individual undermines church, school, neighbor, all kinds of associations. And we can't live that way. Quotation number two, George Will. The proper question for conservatives, what do you seek to conserve? The proper answer, we seek to conserve the American founding. Do you, I put it to you, Dr. Demuth, that national conservatism, properly understood, must seek to conserve the American founding, not to re-found the nation. You have to reject Patrick Deneen and his whole school of thought. Is that fair? Um, no. Um, Take uh, notes, Continenti. This is a big <laughs> opening he's giving you. No, I, I, I believe that uh, national conservatism um, uh, our conservatism is based upon the nation. You know that that is the thing that is actually most uh, distinctive, and it is not just a reaction to uh, the efforts on the left uh, to um, relinquish sovereignty uh, in borders, mm -hmm. move uh, legal authority from representative nations to international bureaucracies like the World Health Organization and so forth. Um, and as part of our nationalism, we revere the American founding. We emphasize the American founding. We have, we have a somewhat uh, different interpretation of aspects of the American founding. We do not believe that America is a creedal nation, that America is defined by an idea. We actually believe that America is defined by hundreds of years of tradition and incremental changes and adaptation to new conflicts. Um, and we believe it goes back hundreds of years before that uh, to the emergence of Anglo-American common law, which was incorporated uh, pretty thoroughly into the American constitutional uh, order. There is an interesting question which I, I sort of have a, a blind spot. I, I listen to this, uh, and uh, you can you can listen you can listen to Patrick Deneen talking about liberalism, and and there are others in the national conservatism conservative movement who will say um, the liberalism of the past con contained the seeds of its own destruction. Yes, that's Deneen's and point. others will say um, the liberalism of the past. Uh, uh, has simply emphasized the individual over the community at a time when community structures and religious could faith, be taken for granted. You could, you could take them for granted. Yes. But we can't take them for granted anymore. Right. So we have to ship back and forth. They're interesting arguments. I don't care about them that much uh, because uh, uh, Patrick Deneen would agree uh, wholeheartedly with me that we need to put more emphasis on the values of of community, of faith, uh, of how the individual uh, actually just doesn't kind of float down from heaven, uh, but emerges from family and society, and is in a way an interpretation of society. That's not all, not all there is to it. I want to protect the right of the individual to, to go off on his or her own, uh, but, uh, but we need some rebalancing. If I can add one more, one point. Uh, there's this uh, tension in the founding between the Declaration and the Constitution. Yes. And those of us who are Americans, and we see how Abraham Lincoln uh, reinserted the Declaration and combined it with the Constitution, that's actually part of our lived tradition. We think about things in that way. But that does not make us a creedal nation. Um, uh, the preamble to the Constitution has this wonderful language, 
which is a big part of my political beliefs. But the Constitution, but the Declaration is mainly a bill of particulars against the stuff that King George was doing. Yes, uh, yes. The Parliament was not resisting. He said, we're not going to do any of that anymore. It was in the tradition of the Magna Carta. It was not yes, yes. John Locke, you know, it, it wasn't this well, abstract it was theorizing. It was one thing after another. The, the, the Civil War, it was not actually a speech at Gettysburg. It was a fight in which hundreds of thousands of people died. It was an act, and it was followed by specific positive law in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to say, we're defined by an idea. We're defined by our deeds. We're defined by the things we did uh, from, the found, from our forebearers to the founders uh, down, down to the present okay. day. And that is nationhood at its best. Are there bad parts of nationhood? You bet. Uh, but uh, so you're but, you're you're but but we are we're we're emphatically um, uh, uh, we're emphatically of the view uh, that adherence to the Constitution, the preservation of the Constitution against many threats uh, from uh, the left. Uh, is you will a say, central part of you what we're say, about. You will say, all right, all right, all right. Yes, the Declaration of Independence, because it's part of the history of this nation. And I would say, oh, no, no, the Declaration of Independence, because it is the font of the history of this nation. And there you would say, no, you go too far, Robinson. I, I, would, I would not. I would Come in, Matthew. Well, um, I, I, I would I would disagree with you if you say the preamble to the Constit the preamble to the Declaration, Declaration is the font of America. I would disagree with that. I would say it's important, but I would say it gives expression to ideas is, that have I, already I, been worked I, out. I, I think you know you know what I care about. I care about trial by jury. Yep. Well, I you, care about I care about due process, the separation of prosecution from the enactment of laws. Of course, it's hard that's, to separate That's where our freedoms things. actually come from. Right, I mean, and it, but it, it's also hard to separate out the rhetoric of the American political tradition from the deeds of it, from the reality of it. It's not really an either or choice between uh, the creed and the culture, to use the terms that Samuel Huntington used in his 2004 book, Who Are We? It's a both and proposition, to use right. Lincoln's term. It's, it's the war, it's the 600,000 dead. Uh, it's the amendments that followed it, but it is also the Gettysburg Address. And, and I think we need to take a more, uh, I know it's a trendy word, I hope it's not too woke for this table, inclusive approach to the American political the tradition out of here. that combines <laughs> both the propositions as well as the institutions. Um, a couple things on um, nationhood and then Deneen. First, nations are not actually that distinctive. There are many of them. There, there, there are plenty of nations. There are more nations all the time. What's distinctive about this one are, is the, the creedal aspect of it, right? And the fact that it has a particular founding that was uh, a product of um, not only um, uh, specific items uh, of rebuke, but also rational thought in how this constitution would um, give sovereignty to the people, and allow that sovereignty to express itself in a way uh, that produced ordered liberty, right? So I think we have to always recognize as conservatives what makes America indeed exceptional. And I think that's been part of the American conservative tradition throughout the hundred years I talk about in the book. And finally, um, the Deneen dispute, the Deneen will dispute, does manifest itself in foreign policy in particular. And I have noticed a emerging divide within the national conservative movement in recent months over its approach to foreign policy, where you have one camp uh, who, like Chris, is a vocal defender of the rights of the Ukraine and Taiwan against foreign domination, and precisely because they are independent nations. Mm -hmm. But there are others within this movement uh, who are not so sympathetic uh, to Ukraine or, or to Taiwan, and in fact take a very different approach, precisely because the ideas of individual liberty, individual rights, what we consider classical liberalism, does not matter to them. So I, I think that's one tension to watch in the coming years as national conservatism develops, is what is its approach to foreign policy and how does that approach either reflect or reject 
the, the principles of the American founding. Demuth, yes. Continenti and I are fine with national conservatism as long as it means you. <laughs> Let me um, hold, hold on. Can I? Can I? Can I? Can I? Res can I respond? No, not just, just not just yet. You're going to have to put it on pause for a moment. moment. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're the, no, you're the father of us all, Chris. No, 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 of no, course. No. Go ahead. I, I just uh, let me just take take one point uh, that Matthew made uh, where I where I have got a a, a different view. Please. Um, that's what I'm trying. You, it, it's, it seems so elusive to me, to, a, a succinct definition. But go ahead. Um, uh, I am quite, one of the things that he and I uh, disagreed with uh, in that little uh, exchange in the Wall Street Journal is whether the national part of national conservatism makes any difference, or whether it's yes. just sort yes. of surplus. It and and I think that that this different view, uh, my difference here is an illustration of that. Um, there are lots and lots of nations in the world, and we begin with the idea that differences among na that nations are a reflection of particular cultural, linguistic, religious, historical circumstances, and their differences should be respected. And those of us in America who were trained on John Locke and Thomas Jefferson uh, should pause a little bit before we say, the whole world has to obey our views. That's not quite the. It's not quite as bad as the Chinese saying everybody has to follow. But th there is this I, this excessive uh, abstractionism to it. Um, what I like about national. One of the things I most like about nationalism, and why I think it is particularly pertinent to the circumstances of conservatism, conservatives in America today, is that. Conservatism, it's, it's not a solution. Uh, it's a process. It's something that you pursue. You try to figure out how can we be an effective nation, this polyglot nation, you yes. know, huge and with layered sovereignties of different nations. How can we be an effective nation? Are we an effective nation today? Do we even have the means to help out the Ukraines and Taiwans uh, uh, of the world. I mean, we can give speeches about it. You know, no, I'm an old-fashioned neocon. I think we should. Can we do it? You know, the last time I looked, we're broke. The point of nationalism for Americans is that it encourages unromantic self-knowledge. That's what I am for. Do I think America is an exceptional nation? Um, sure. Yeah, and, and I really mean that. We certainly have an exceptional past. Are we exceptional today? I actually don't know, but I don't want to try to answer any problems by saying I believe or I don't believe America is exceptional. What I want to ask is, is America an effective nation? Can we, do we have sufficient bonds of loyalty and a sense of common destiny that we can act together in the face of challenges foreign and domestic? It's a different kind of a question, and I think that that is the one that should be central to us. Mm. Can, do you want to have a little rejoinder? I'd like to move on to, I've got, I've got something I think quite clever. Go ahead. All right. I have clips of two or three conservative presidents, just brief clips. I guess fundamentally I'd like you to grade them. In a speech I gave 25 years ago, I told a story that I think bears repeating. Two friends of mine were talking to a refugee from communist Cuba. He had escaped from Castro. And as he told his story of his horrible experiences, one of my friends turned to the other and said, we don't know how lucky we are. And the Cuban stopped and said, how lucky you are. I had some place to escape to. Well, no, America's freedom does not belong to just one nation. We're custodians of freedom for the world. A plus, I mean, the gold standard, but at the same time, something of an exception in the history of American conservatism. Very few politicians were able to frame the language of freedom and also its institutional and cultural supports in the way that Ronald Reagan did. He was our hero, Chris, when we were both young men in this town. But are you still going to give we, him a we, good... We worked for him. Are we still going to give him a high grade? That was pretty internationalist uh, language there. Um, it was certainly exceptionalist language. It was exceptionalist language, uh, and it was, it was part of anti-communist language. Um, in, in a world uh, that it, uh, 
There are millions of people that want to come to America uh, in circumstances that do not involve the existential, existential threat of communism. Um, I, I do not believe that Ronald Reagan would be an open, open borders no, progressive no, no, I, if right. he were here today. Right. That implies that he recognizes the existence of constraint. He recognized that there are constraints upon action, even of a nation as rich and prosperous uh, as we are. Matthew. So, so, so there are high ideals. I'm for pursuing those ideals within a budget and within a sense of constraint. Matthew, you write in the right, while we're on Ronald Reagan, Reagan's unique personality and the extraordinary success of his presidency obscured the larger history of the American right of which he was just one part. Explain. It sound, you, you're both hard men to please. You argue, in effect, that Reagan was just a little too good for conservatives. Well, uh, maybe we didn't quite appreciate how unique his gifts were. Also, his um, constancy over time. You look at Ronald Reagan's first kind of public statement of his political views. They come in a Hedda Hopper Hollywood gossip column in 1947 after Reagan testifies as part of his job as president of the Screen Actors Guild about communist infiltration in Hollywood. He talks about the dignity of the individual, freedom, um, American exceptionalism, all in one brief answer to Hedda Hopper in 1947. The same things he's talking about when he leaves office in the farewell address in 1989. Somehow, Reagan's belief system, which I think formed uh, as a child um, under the influence of both of his parents, uh, was in tune with American conservatism after the Second World War and into the Cold War. We forget Ronald Reagan voted for FDR four times, mm -hmm. right? He didn't become a Republican until... And he was, supported Harry Truman in yes, 52. Yes, he didn't become a Republican until he was 51 years old. Mm -hmm. And so... When I look at the history of the right and I think about Ronald Reagan's importance in that period, the Cold War, um, it seems to me that Reagan is actually more of the exception in the history of the right than the rule. That if you look at the period on the right that preceded Ronald Reagan, that preceded the Cold War, many of its um, political tonalities and also its policy positions resemble the right after him, the right we're living today. And I'll just name three. The right before Reagan was... Uh, very skeptical of foreign intervention, right? Defined itself against Wilsonianism and the legacy of World War I, opposed American entry into World War II. We see similar things on the right today. The right prior to the Cold War, prior to Ronald Reagan, uh, was protectionist, mm -hmm. believed in insulating America from global economic competition. Uh, we see that, of course, on the right today, uh, the Trump right, the tariff man right, right? And then... Um, the, the right prior to Ronald Reagan, prior to the Cold War, uh, was restrictionist in its attitude toward immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, uh, responsible for basically closing America to immigration for about 40 years. And now we're seeing on the right today a steadfast opposition to illegal immigration, for sure, and securing the border, but also the beginnings of some conversations about how to reform the legal immigration system. So when I look at that history, I see Ronald Reagan as more of the exception than the rule. And you, you, let, me make, let me make one point about uh, Reagan. Um, he, he was a great man. He was one of our greatest presidents. Uh, he came along at just the right time. Um, and uh, uh, I, I pulled up my wife and family and moved here from a job that I loved uh, the day after he was shot because I could not, not work for this man. So I've got very uh, deep uh, abiding admiration for him. But let me, let me just make this point. He was a great politician. And it's important for Overlooked. us, it's important for us to recognize, to extol uh, the, the job of the politician, which we are, you know, we usually make fun of and we can't stand because they're always compromising, they're doing this and that. Um, but he, he was a great politician, and part of being a great politician is to obscure the terrible trade-offs that are involved in life and that are involved in statecraft. And he was a master of doing that. He would take 
these ideals and to make these ideals resonate is part of great national leadership. But it is not, it is not, it is not the only thing. And I want to go back, go back to my point that in particular actions, he often recognized, uh, recognized constraints. Right. Um, actual deployment of force abroad in his eight years, two times, Le Lebanon and a weekend down in uh, Grenada. Um, uh, he uh, negotiated uh, uh, de facto tariffs on the Japanese. He appeared in front of the working class guys at the Harley Davidson factory, uh, extolling um, American manufacturing and keeping the foreigners out. So, um, so he, he was a very effective practical politician. We can look at these words and be um, enthusiastic about them, but we have to recognize that Ronald Reagan too, he was making compromises every day of the week, and he was he, and he was. He was very good at keeping uh, keeping the rhetoric at a very high level, which was important, but it's not the only thing. The second inaugural address of George W. Bush. We are led by events and common sense to one conclusion. The survival of liberty in our land increasingly depends on the success of liberty in other lands. The best hope for peace in our world is the expansion of freedom in all the world. Matthew? So as a piece of rhetoric, very high grade. As an example of conservative rhetoric, um, not so much. Uh, there are two propositions. The first in that we heard was to say that the success of freedom in the United States depends on the success of freedom overseas. If anything, I think the opposite is more true. And that, is, and that is to say the best hope for freedom overseas is, is the freedom here. Um, the second statement that he was making um, was uh, about the uh, expansion of liberty abroad. Um, and that, while part of um, Reagan's rhetoric as well, had a very different approach to operationalizing it, as Chris kind of alluded to in the um, uh, previous answer. The most important thing to know about George W. Bush was he hated what he called small ball. He was the mm -hmm. co-owner of the Rangers, loved baseball. He, was, he always wanted to go for the grand slam. And he went for the Grand Slam in his second term. And the result was the fracturing of the American right on war, on immigration, and then with the financial crisis on uh, the bailouts and um, the approach to political economy. Chris? Um, I, I think his essential argument there is correct in the, in the words that we listened to. Um, <clears throat> If the world around us becomes hostile to freedom, if there are more and more unfree countries in the world, that is bad for the survival and prosperity of freedom uh, within America. I think that that is true. Um, that leaves two important questions unanswered. First is, what do we mean by freedom? It, it all depends on what, what freedom, and I'm not trying to be, you know, obscure or fancy or, uh, or evasive, uh, but the modern definition of freedom, certainly on the left, is untrammeled, unconstrained, ind individual autonomy. It is summarized by Justice Kennedy's uh, uh, dictum that we all can define our own meaning of the universe. And what modern progressivism adds to it is <clears throat> If somebody defines their own meaning of the universe, everybody else has to get out of the way and help that help that happen. So, and 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 the the second is how does America best guarantee the survival of a a, a productive freedom uh, around the world, 
uh, and uh, we have a long experience that trying to impose our ideas of a constitutional order on nations with no such uh, uh, traditions for the sorts of things we want them to, you know, the... The idea of invading Iraq with a massive force on the theory that we could turn that country into democracy was... Um, I, I would say that on the day of the invasion, that was not the theory. That was, it, that's the problem. It, be, it became the theory. It became the theory was, once was, the original was theory was very, proven. It was a very serious uh, mission creep, in my view. And you can see <clears throat> the problems. Uh, I'm not just complaining or trying to complicate things. Um, the idea of, of expanding freedom abroad um, eventually had our insisting on um, women's freedom courses being taught at Iraqi and Afghanistan universities. Yes. I think still today it involves um, flying gay pride flags above embassies in deeply Christian African nations. At the is Vatican. This, is, At this the Vatican. Help, is this helping to promote freedom around the globe? Okay. I don't think so. Donald Trump. The fundamental question of our time is whether the West has the will to survive. Do we have the confidence in our values to defend them at any cost? Do we have enough respect for our citizens to protect our borders? Do we have the desire and the courage to preserve our civilization in the face of those who would subvert and destroy it? We can have the largest economies and the most lethal weapons anywhere on Earth. But if we do not have strong families and strong values, then we will be weak, and we will not survive. Best speech of Trump's presidency, the Warsaw speech. Uh, praised, actually, by some of his critics uh, during the uh, 2016 campaign. Um, of course, a speech like that which his very talented speechwriters wrote for Donald Trump, was not the be-all and end-all of the Trump presidency. Right. <laughs> right? right. And it, right. I think Trump's trajectory could have been very different had he kind of stuck to that script that he laid out in Warsaw and not been... Uh, you could build a whole administration on yeah, that. Not been that, distracted right. by what people were talking about on uh, MSNBC that morning. Right. Chris? Um, I thought... I, I agree uh, with Matthew. I thought it was the... I, there were three or four, but I thought that the Warsaw speech was uh, the best. Uh, I agree with uh, what he says here. I wish he'd, uh, I wish he'd uh, stuck with it. Uh, as a quibble, you know, since we're intellectuals, we have to quibble with things. Uh, there's a little too emph much emphasis on will. Uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, was, is a very willful individual, and I think he emphasizes the element of will a little bit too much. There's also to political artfulness. There is the construction of coalitions. Um, uh, there's a lot more to the success of, uh, of the American project and the defense of Western civilization than will. Okay. Now, final questions here. For my benefit, I want to nail this down. I want to understand what national conservatism is, and if it can be made acceptable to Brother Continenti here. So let me quote a little bit further from Matthew's letter to the editor in response to your piece in the journal. And the question here is the extent to which what troubled Matthew about your piece was matter, were matters of substance or whether it's just tone, whether it's somehow or other you're playing a trombone and he's playing a clarinet and you're both actually playing from the same sheet of music. You just don't quite like the sound of what the other man is doing. I can't quite, this is, all right. This is you, Matthew. What struck me most about Mr. Demuth's essay was its incongruity with speeches delivered at the recent National Conservatism Conference. This was a conference, there have been a number of them now. This was a conference in Orlando. And you, Chris, in signing on to National Conservatism, are signing on to a movement. There are a lot of people who have associated themselves with national conservatism, including our friend Yoram Hazoni. All right. 
At that conference, speakers proposed a government-directed industrial policy. That's, that's substantive. And held up Hungary as some sort of model for America. I'll take my conservatism without modification. <coughs> Constitutionalist, market-oriented, and unapologetically American. Close quote. Do you want to stand by all of that after listening to his explications here today? I do. Uh, Chris, of course, wrote a letter to the editor in response to my know, letter to this, the editor. This is, <laughs> then, we, then we've been but, infinitely yeah, fresh. Yeah, it's yes. like a, almost a blog-like. But I do. I, um, I think that American conservative thought is distinctly American, and we're part of a tradition uh, that reflects the totality of the American political tradition, the creed as well as the culture, the declaration as well as the constitution. Uh, and that we and also a political economy that favors freedom and individual so, liberties. What would you say to Chris? Here, I'll set it up for you, Chris. Chris, you're a brilliant man. We all owe you a great deal. Thank but this, you. This national conservatism—it's unnecessary and a little bit troublesome. Here's why you should come home to simple, unamended conservatism, and the reasons are. Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily put it. People are free to have their opinions, uh, Peter. Even I, Demuse? Of course, more, uh, more than anyone. Uh, but but I, what struck me about uh, Chris's essay in the journal was that I didn't uh, disagree with any of it, right? So that's why I didn't but quite... But there's still bits that and you I, don't I like. Do think that, I do think that nationalism has been part of the American conservative tradition. And this is why I tried to separate the American conservative tradition from the Republican Party over the last right. 20 years, right? The Republican Party over the last 20 years, pre-Trump, was not necessarily nationalist. That's different from conservatism. And there are people that both of us knew and admired, such as Irving Kristol and Norman Podhoretz, who claimed nationalism as part of the um, conservative tradition. William F. Buckley Jr., somewhat uncomfortable with the word nationalism, but the distinctions sometimes people draw between patriotism and nationalism is very, uh, can be very um, gray, right, and uh, permeable. So uh, I was just struck by how reasonable the essay sounded in contrast to some of the speeches that I heard where uh, I saw advocates of people, uh, uh, advocates rather of turning away from the American tradition, turning away from a political, political economy of individualism and liberty. And I, I, uh, uh, rethinking uh, our, nor our constitutional norms. And, um, and there, I, I simply say, not for me. Reverse. Persuade him to become a national conservative. <laughs> I, I think that the, um, first of all, Peter, as you said, uh, it is a movement. Uh, it's, it's a big movement, and there were people, there have been people at our conferences uh, that I agreed with and disagreed with on, you know, I think in Orlando, uh, one speaker wanted to uh, break up big tech. And uh, I have a background in antitrust and uh, breaking up IBM, breaking up AT&T. Some of these things don't end up going so well. Right. Um, so, so I'm a skeptic, but am, am I opposed to it? Do I think... You know, I'm, you glad they, the I'm glad they give that talk. Uh, I am for as long as these firms have monopolies, I'm for the common carrier obligation. And I have a long history of writing against the government common carrier obligation when it came to the Interstate Commerce Commission. Uh, uh, but I would be uh, in, in favor uh, of uh, such obligations in the case of big corporations that are obviously trying to uh, skew uh, American political debate and with with some uh, considerable success. So the um, Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement yes, yes. that Trump dumped, I was so happy when he dumped it because I actually was looking at what that was doing and it was replicating the European Union. If you looked at, the, you know, th there was some pro-free trade in it, but you know what it was doing? Harmonized taxes. Harmonize labor regulations. Okay. Harmonize environmental regulations. That was, it was a, good a move. It was a government policy cartel. You were in good riddance. I think there were problems with the way that many trade agreements have been written in in recent decades. They're not necessarily opening up markets, but they're 
to what Chris okay. is saying. They're, they're regularizing things. However, I, in the case of the TPP, to simply abandon it without an alternative, I think left us strategically vulnerable to China. And that we have to remember that sometimes trade can be an ally of diplomacy and military partnerships. That's in fact why the right to some degree, I never changed thought I'd its find view. myself thinking that Demuth was the hothead. It changed its view on, on, um, on free trade during the Cold War. So, I, that to me was the mistake. That I think there's a All way right. to use okay. trade to further our interests Here's against China. One. Here's another one. For, I'm, just, I'm just sort of a few practical problems, and the hope that this will help me grasp the differences in tone or in substance between the two of you. Actually, this is more open-ended than that. Google. A majority of its profits come from outside this country, likewise Facebook, likewise any number of other tech companies. Why should the executives running those companies, whose job Milton Friedman would tell us is to enrich their shareholders, why should they feel any loyalty to the United States of America? Because they are Americans. I mean, I... Again, here, there's not much of a difference between me and Chris, especially when we consider the challenge of China. We have to think through these things. Now, what that means is we should find a way to help and, um, or, or to um, not make the perfect the enemy of the good in our attitudes toward tech and Silicon Valley. The fact is they are American companies. Their employees might not act like it. Their CEOs might not act like it, but they are American companies. And in some, it's better to have them be American companies than Chinese companies. And of course, China has its alternatives. And so I think some um, means of uh, approach with Silicon Valley needs to be found that can retain their status as our national champions while also re rejecting uh, the, the um, insinuation of China, Chinese business practices and politics uh, into their into their internal machinery. Okay. okay. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, I, a lot of this discussion has been foreign policy based. Let me take a, a domestic uh, example that I that I can see does illustrate a division between traditional conservatives and national conservatives, uh, and it involves the use of government in the marketplace, in a sense, um, and. And it, it, it illustrates the very different moral ecology in which the corporation operates today mm -hmm. uh, from what it did in the day of Michael Novak. And that is the uh, Governor DeSantis and the Florida legislature uh, passing legislation that says, in our schools in Florida, we're not going to teach kindergartners and first grades. We're not going we're not going to teach uh, little children about gender optionality and transgender possibilities. We're just not going to do that to young people. And Walt Disney, a company that built its brand on trying to keep all of us young well beyond third grade and enjoy the innocence of childhood, um, condemned that measure and took active steps uh, to oppose it. And uh, the governor and the legislature withdrew some of their tax privileges at Disney World. Okay. Now, that's activist government trying to stand up for the culture. And I'm not trying to categorize people, but, there, but DeSantis was criticized. That was disproportionate. If you disagree with Disney, you should give a speech. You shouldn't be using the power of the government to punish your political adversaries. Let me tell you, every national conservative cheered DeSantis on. That's exactly what we have in mind. The... Uh, privileges that they had were provided by the state. Uh, and if a company is going to act with the ideological foolishness of attaching itself to transgender teaching of little children, um, that the government should just give a speech but not try to uh, react to it and should not try to withdraw some of the privileges that were given to Disney long ago and to show that, it, that the government will be an active part of these uh, debates and, and take action, not just talk, 
Uh, I think that that's different, and I think that there are some traditional conservatives that said that was a bad thing to do. So, so that, I'm just trying to take no, no, one no, little point that, sh that shows you a difference between us. Matthew, listen to this. This struck me coming into this as the keynote of national conservatism, and I'm not sure that anything I've heard today dissuades me. This is a, I, Chris may think I'm being crude here or missing something, and of course he'll correct me because Chris doesn't hesitate to correct me. But here is a passage from Chris's essay. When the American left was liberal and reformist, conservatives played our customary role as moderators of change. But today's woke progressivism isn't reformist. It seeks to turn the world upside down. When the leftward party in a two-party system is seized by such radicalism, the conservative instinct for moderation is futile. National conservatives recognize that in today's politics, the excesses are of the essence. We must shift to opposing revolution." Close quote. That's what I take, still, after this conversation, as the animating impulse of national conservatism. We must fight back. Do you sign on? Do you I'm, take that I'm as all the for fighting back against the left? The question is, is, is it done prudently? Is it done on the right ground? Is it done in a way that will, it won't alienate the middle of the country, everyday normal Americans who decide elections? I mean, this is the critical question. I also think the DeSantis example is an interesting one. DeSantis removed privileges that had been given to Disney already. And in some of his other squabbles with corporations, it's about tax privileges that the government of Florida had already granted. In a way, DeSantis is just furthering an anti-cronist agenda that has been long part of the American right. In fact, even libertarians might think, oh, maybe these companies shouldn't deserve these privileges. That's why I think the DeSantis program is actually a point of contact between national conservatism and unmodified conservatism. I think there are ways in which both sides can actually support that agenda and that politician. So um, I think we're, we're, we're with the two sides part company is when differences in, uh, okay, are we going to go from removing privileges to active punishment, the punitive nature, right? Or, um, in a different, are we going to, um, put our energies uh, behind uh, politicians who have concrete proposals for these issues? Or are we going to support politicians who have um, uh, an apocalyptic or in some cases even conspiratorial worldview? That's, that's where I think the critical differences are. Gentlemen, last question, last question. Christopher DeMuth, Matthew Continetti, you both found yourselves drawn to conservative politics when you were undergraduates. Actually, I think in your case, it was Republican politics. You started out as a squish. As a matter of fact, you, you started, started out as, as a liberal Democrat. Li right? Oh, you started as a liberal truth. Democrat? Yeah. Yes. Oh, you've submerged yeah. that piece of the biography. All right. Here's the question. I think AEI is running its summer intern program right now. Bright kids from impressive institutions in their 20s. Why does it matter? Not why does America matter. Why does American conservatism matter enough for you and you to have dedicated your professional lives to it? Why does conservatism matter? Chris? Um, I have dedicated my, my uh, career to it uh, because of an abiding love of my country and the blessings that completely unearned have been just showered upon me uh, since I was a child and are showered upon many other people uh, that uh, that I live with uh, and and I've always thought instinctively uh, that these blessings can't they're not manna from heaven they're actually the result they're an artifact of human action we build the institutions uh, that give us these things you know, God's blessings are things that we have to work to protect and build. 
And uh, so, there's, so there's great work to do. You can't take it for granted. And in my view, the risks that we're facing, I, I'm not apocalyptic, but I think the risks we're facing are pretty dire. I think that they're, I think that they're more threatening than those America was facing in the late 1960s when I first got into uh, to politics. And I think that um, the young generation um, and the national conservatives are disproportionately quite young and from a very different historical, uh, uh, from a different uh, personal uh, uh, background. Um, I think that they are concerned. And as somebody who's kind of at the other end of the career trajectory, I'm just thrilled to be um, work, working with them as they formulate their own uh, ideas of what we need to do going forward. Matthew Continenti, you are the author of the book on American conservatism. Why does it matter? Well, uh, it matters because uh, America matters, and America traditions matter, and the American tradition of freedom matters. I became a conservative while uh, reading the great texts of Western thought and uh, as part of my uh, college curriculum. And uh, what, I struck, what struck me was that from the insights into human uh, fallenness and the limits of our knowledge that I was picking up from the Greeks and the Bible, and then later on I read Adam Smith and Edmund Burke and the Federalist Papers and I see how those insights that I had read in the ancients and in the, the Bible uh, were being applied to modern politics and to modern political economy. And this is the tradition that I think American conservatives seek to preserve, this tradition of freedom. And it's a very fragile thing, as Chris said. It's also a very rare thing, as we heard from Ronald Reagan earlier in the program. And that, I think, is what uh, we need to defend uh, and, and save for the next generation. Christopher DeMuth and Matt Continenti, author most recently of The Right, Thank you. For Uncommon Knowledge, the Hoover Institution and Fox Nation, filming today here at the offices of the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, I'm Peter Robinson.